Hello, it's Bob Wells here, and welcome to another episode of the Undercurrent Stories podcast. It's the middle of the summer here in the UK. It's been really hot, and so we've got a really great episode, which I hope will cool you down. You may have been eating an ice cream, you've probably obtained some food or drink from your fridge, and you might have even put some ice in your drink, perhaps a smoothie, or even a gin and tonic if it's a bit later in the day. We use our fridges and our freezers constantly. Our supermarkets have whole aisles of chilled and frozen food and each day refrigerated trucks roll by continuously. We take all this for granted, but it hasn't always been like this. And here to discuss the transformative power of refrigeration, I'm delighted to welcome Nicola Twilley to the show. Nicola is an award-winning contributor to The New Yorker. She's the co-host of Gastropod, an award-winning podcast that looks at food through the lens of science and history. And she has just published her latest book called Frostbite. How Refrigeration Changed Our Food, Our Planet and Ourselves. Hello and welcome to the show, Nikki. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to have you on. Thank you for coming on the show. Now, you're based in LA, I believe. I am, yes. Uh, I have been here for the past six, seven years, something along those lines. Before we talk about refrigeration and your book, Frostbite, please tell us a little bit about yourself, could you, and, and your life's journey and how you became interested in refrigeration. Uh, so, well, where to begin? So listeners might or might not be able to tell. I get differing responses that I grew up in the UK. Um, I still say tomato, <laughs> which uh, throws people for a loop over here. Um, but uh, but yes, I grew up in the UK, uh, studied English lit, fancied a job in publishing, failed the copy editing test, decided to do a, 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 you know, can't get a job, go back to school. So I went, I went to, uh, decided to do a master's degree in art history in Chicago, really because they gave me a scholarship and it was somewhere new, a uh, different subject, sounded fun. Met an American and had been here ever since. Um, and as I was trying to work out, you know, I, I I increasingly realized that the people who had the most fun were the people who got to uh, go and research things and then tell people about it in some form. So initially I thought I might be a, a curator in a museum or a, a, a public programs person who sort of got to dive into a topic and then create programs or exhibitions around that. And I did actually do that for Ben Franklin's 300th birthday, which is fascinating because we don't really learn about the founding fathers in British no. schools, but Americans are all, you know, absolutely bored rigid by the topic by the time they get <laughs> get to 18. So I was asked, oh, have you heard? This guy did this. He was amazing, fascinating. So it's kind of a perfect job for me because uh, I was the sort of last remaining adult in America who didn't know who Ben Franklin was. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, took that route then uh I thought I'd found a little niche for myself I was gonna uh celebrate founding fathers 300th anniversaries for the rest of my career um but unfortunately the next one was about 25 years later Franklin turned out to be a generation older than everyone else so uh, long and roundabout away I ended up starting a blog just to write about things I was interested in primarily actually food um and uh that was at the start of when blogging was a thing you could do. And like a lot of people who started a blog in those days, um, that's where sort of newspaper editors and magazine editors went trawling for new writers. And so that's how I became a journalist. Um, and the food connection is not just because I love it, but also I realized you need um, – what I call a productive constraint. So you need a something to focus your interest. In. Otherwise, you're just writing about anything and everything. And for me, I realized, oh, food, you can write about history, you can write about science, you can write about design, you can write about um, marketing, and you can write about culture and labor issues and uh, sensory science. I mean, you can write about almost anything re relationship sound you, you know you can write about anything with a relationship to food cross species interactions and so I realized that that was going to be sort of the 
the productive constraint. There's very little you can't write about, but somehow having that frame makes it all make sense, at least to me. And then the blog sort of turned into the podcast. Is, is that, was it a natural evolution? Well, it, I mean, the blog uh, turned me into a journalist. Uh, then I, I want to, the, the story of the podcast is I want a fellowship to, to do a, a food and farming article with Michael Pollan, um, who some listeners might have heard of. He wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma famously, um, and now is sort of more into, uh, he writes about caffeine, hallucinogens, things like that. But uh, he had sort of been a big figure in the start of farm to table writing and thinking, thinking about, oh, what, uh, what, how actually is our food grown? We sort of are so distanced from it in today's food system. Um, maybe we should go and have a look. And he was one of the first people who really sort of took people onto these, these giant industrial cattle feeding lots and things like that. And he had a fellowship, um, that I I was one of the inaugural class of fellows, and actually my podcast co-host was the was another of the inaugural class of six, and she was the one with the background in radio, um, and we got along, stayed in touch. Podcasting was just getting started. It was the summer when Serial, the first season of Serial, came out, and f- for the first time, you didn't actually have to explain to people what a podcast <laughs> was. Um, they, they so many people sort yeah. of knew, um, and so she said, "Oh, I want to start one of these, and it's going to be about food science and history." And I said, "Well, you can't do it on your own." Um, uh, Obviously, you need a co-host, not realizing that I was essentially proposing marriage because we spend all day, every day talking to each other now. We're on different coasts. She's in Boston, but we just log on in the morning, work together uh, all day. And I thought, you know, how hard could it be? Because I was a journalist already. Well, it's quite a bit more work, actually. Um, But that's how that happened. And actually, funnily enough, the book Frostbite actually came out of that fellowship too, because the story I had pitched to win the fellowship, which was about China and uh, and going to China to visit the world's first frozen dumpling billionaire as a way to look at the fact that China had built, uh, it had refrigerated its food system, built a cold chain basically overnight. You know, China being China, they said, well, they put it in their, you know, fifth 12 year plan or whatever, and then just did it. And I thought this, I was already interested in refrigeration. And I thought, oh, this is so, it did, cool. I was about to say, this is so cool, <laughs> unintended, to be able to see what happens when a country refrigerates overnight, basically. I mean, in the US, that transition, in the UK, even that transition happened so long ago, that it's sort of now the 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 way things are seems like the way things have always been but in china it was it was so quick that you could see it sort of you know what had happened in real time and so i uh pitched that story got the funding to do that story wrote that story for the new york times magazine but what's funny is on the fellowship all my fellow fellows and michael himself they, they all said listen Yes, you can write this as an article, but it's a book. Be real. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and I was in denial for a while, um, but they were right. And so that's that's sort of how the book, the book and the podcast came yeah. really out of the same fellowship. Yeah. Well, obviously, the, the scope for the podcast is is very wide and, and the scope of refrigeration and freezing is is very wide as well. How, how did you, before we talk about the, some of the... Um, stuff that you've got in the book, which incidentally, I'm probably about a third of the way through, I'm listening to it on Spotify. So it's, uh, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, oh, I've got amazing. a bit, I've got, to, well, I've got oh, to the, got good, to the good, bit good. where they're, they're taking ice out of the lake. And, um, but we can probably talk about that later. Ah, yeah. um, so it's a massive scope, as yes. I say. You've, you've still, you've got a very gruesome You've got a very gruesome oh, chapter up ahead oh, of you. Right. Sorry, the the meat chapter is uh, don't do it on okay. an empty I'll stomach. Make sure I listen anyway. to it in the morning then. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the scope yeah. for writing a book about refrigeration, which I suppose essentially is is if we take away um, cooling systems for houses and and air conditioning, it's more of it, it's about you know the evolution of preservation of food, isn't it? Exactly. You've yeah, you've hit on it completely. How did you start? Because you know you've got history, you've you've got technology, you've got 
science. How did you start such a project? What did you do? What was what was day one like? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you you might want to talk to my editor, who was a very patient lady. Um, and at a certain point, when I think I was six or seven years late with the book, uh, said, why don't you choose a new deadline and actually hit it? Um, and so <laughs> as I'm saying that to sort of explain that it, I really didn't know where to start. And I think it is because it's such a huge topic. And I had tried to constrain it in the way that you say that wasn't cooling as a whole, really was just refrigeration. And as you say, that's, that's really just sort of the most recent step in our millennia long kind of battle against the microbes and fungi that want to eat our food before we do. <laughs> Which is what <laughs> and, it is, isn't it? <laughs> and so, um, yeah. exactly. It's just, a, it's, you know, this is an, n- no small amount of human ingenuity has been devoted to sort of keeping food fresh. It's really, I mean, as, as you can imagine, especially before today's era of you know, at least in the supermarkets, whether you can afford it or not, abundance. Um, Before that, you know, the struggle to preserve food was sort of existential. I mean, it was, you know, that and reproduction were the two things you needed. Um, So anyway, how did I do it? The, the, uh, I'm very much a structure person. I always think about things in terms of structure first. Some writers do, some writers don't. And I realized, so that helped me. I wanted to go, I wanted to give it a sense that you were moving along the cold chain. So the cold chain is the sort of technical term for the whole network of refrigerated spaces that keep food cold on its way from the farm to the table. So from, you know, the refrigerated warehouses and the and the trucks and the refrigerated trains and the shipping containers and the, you know, the 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 reefer ships all the way to the supermarket chill cabinets all the way to your home fridge. So I wanted to move along that uh angle and I wanted to move through time. So from earliest times to, you know, the present day to the future. And so once I had sort of uh, got my uh, two tracks that the book runs along simultaneously, I started to be able to sort of work out where things should go. And then it was really just a matter of trying to control myself because, you know, I'd talk to I talked to the apple growers and the apple refrigerated warehousemen and they'd say, Oh, you, you, you have to talk to the salad people. They're the crazy ones. So then I go and talk to the salad people and they say, well, this is nothing. Go and talk to the banana and the avocado people. Yeah. So, you know? And so it was, it, it, it sort of often threatened to spiral completely yeah. out of yeah. control. Um, and sections that are quite short, I feel could be entire books on their own. The section where I look at the impact of refrigeration on human health. So has refrigerating our food system made us healthier or not? It seems like an important question, especially, um, and this is something we haven't talked about yet, but you know, while the developed world has a cold chain, the developing world is building one right now. Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the primary, you know, they countries like Rwanda have pledged to refrigerate their food supply system and that requires building out a, a you know a, a, this enormous cold chain and no one has really sat down and said well but has it made us healthier has it been good for us uh you can a lot of people have started to look at the environmental costs that's a different topic but the but just on the level of nutrition and the, and a lot of people i spoke to said well it must have because now we can have fresh fruits and vegetables. But when you actually look at the research, it's a lot more complicated. And so, you know, what is actually quite a, a small sort of section of one chapter could honestly be about 20 people's yes. PhDs. Yeah, you got another, so I think you've got another few books there. Nikki. Just, just on the, just on the, I'd like to talk about, um, you know, the safety and the hygiene and the, and the sort of science of the food a bit, bit later, if that's okay. But just on the history of it, I mean, I suppose we mentioned earlier on about preservation of food. And I guess um, we know that people and still do salt fish, which keeps them and ferment stuff and, and brew stuff. When, when, when is the first sort of historical evidence that people started to keep their food either, you know, cool or frozen? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's always very hard to know w- exactly what people were doing before writing um, because you might find evidence, but, you know, the intentionality behind it is is tricky. There's actually a British woman, um, unfortunately she just died, uh, an archaeologist specialist in underground archaeology. She is one of the co-founders of Subbrit, uh, Subterranea Britannica, which is the Society for Exploring Underground Spaces in the UK, of which I am a member. Um, very cool group. But uh, she, Sylvia Beeman, um, is one of the sort of archaeologists I talk to in the book who really thinks uh, based on the archaeological evidence and based on um, what is called experimental archaeology, where you try to recreate the conditions and see if it worked, um, she is pretty convinced that as far back as, you know, Neolithic ancestors, people were scraping holes in the ground, packing them with ice and storing their mammoth meat in there. Um, there are other archaeologists, she's not alone, um, the uh, of course and of course you know this is natural cold we're talking about so it, it's only seasonal it's only based on your geography there are researchers in the middle east who found so this is a landscape with a lot, out a lot of snow and ice who found that um people were storing bones in caves um to preserve the the bone marrow oh, right. for later eating and again they did this sort of experimental archaeology stuck bones in caves, um, tried it themselves months later. You know, caves are naturally cool. Uh, humans have always known that. Um, one of the researchers was like, well, it needed a little salt, but it was otherwise it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. you don't you don't envy them that no. they have to eat these things, but, you know, whatever it takes to advance Absolutely. human knowledge. So it does go a long way back. And then, of course, once there's writing, you do get evidence of humans intentionally harvesting and storing ice and using that to cool food. So some of the earliest is from China, actually. Uh, Poetry saying in the third month, you know, we harvest the ice um, and evidence that the emperor would have had an ice pit. And similarly in the Middle East, uh, Uh, tamarisk lined ice wells and heavily guarded apparently so you can pick up these clues that actually it was very rare and special um the they're sort of again we're talking at this point very rudimentary traces but some evidence that you know three days after the ice came down from the mountain it's already gone so and then uh plenty he he writes about getting some ice for a dinner for a friend down from the mountain to chill their wine. And the friend ghosts him. And Pliny writes this very annoyed letter um, saying, well, I'm going to charge you for the ice anyway, because that's that's expensive and it doesn't keep. So, um, yes, it's it, you do see these sort of early traces. So evidently, as long as humans have noticed things, they noticed that cold works to preserve food. They wouldn't have known why, but they yeah. noticed it. I, it's interesting. I, I live in South Lincolnshire and we have a um, a house called Burley House, which you've probably heard of. Um, and that's actually got a, an ice house, which is basically a mound, which you will have heard. Of. I know there's one or two around. Well, there's quite a few around in, the, in, the, in England that tended to be sort of 16th century. Thousands. Oh, thousands this is one of yeah. the things that Sylvia... Yeah, no, this is one of the things that Sylvia Beeman actually documented because a lot of people have just forgotten them. But she actually sort of said, listen, Britain is like a Swiss cheese. There are these ice houses, sort of these forgotten hollows dotting the the ground everywhere. And actually, there's a Scottish archaeologist who thinks that ice ha- abandoned ice houses are responsible for a lot of the legends about hobbits oh, and little well, yeah, they people do look and like so it. on. Because they're <laughs> yeah. these... these yeah, there are these sort of yeah. doors that open directly into the yeah, ground, these yeah, little yeah. mounds. And so that's his that's his theory. But yeah, there are, you know, and these ice houses were a terrific luxury. I mean, the, if you had a stately home, you had it. Normal people would not have tasted cold in their lives, no. you know? And, and they, I haven't fact-checked it, but it, but it said in this thing that I was reading that the, because there's a lake there as well, that they used to take the ice from the lake, stick it into the ice house, and it would last up to three years, which I find incredible. 
That is incredible. So for the book, I went and harvested some ice at a lake in New England, one of the last remaining ice harvests in the US. And this was a funny thing because at its peak, the ice industry, the ice harvesting industry, the natural ice industry, it, so we're talking about sort of the mid 1800s here, um, America's uh, sort of abundance of cold and fresh water was seen like Saudi oil is today. So people were just like, oh, they've got all of this amazing ice just on tap. It's right there, ready for the harvesting. It was seen as this incredible natural resource. Every little lake or, you know, anything that froze up basically in the whole of North America would have been harvested and stored. And they did get quite good at storing it. Um, three years strikes me as quite a long time but if you do it right you really you don't have a, you don't have much shrink and this is how the ice industry was able to become this sort of global trade so they would ship ice from new england to calcutta and you know if you so they they had by this point they had got pretty good at working out how to insulate it but how did they store it on the ship i suppose if there's a huge amount of ice together not not a lot happens to it does it or exactly in the hold uh, packed it very tightly. You're absolutely right that you that it's how tightly you pack it that makes the difference. So you use chippings to fill in the gaps between the blocks. And then the other thing that was a huge benefit in New England is the other big industry was lumber. And so they had a lot of sawdust that was previously just irritating waste. It used to clog up the, the streams. But now they kept it because that's great oh, insulation. Wow, yeah. So you would insulate the whole yeah, yeah, yeah. hold yeah. of the ship. Yeah. That's interesting. So um, another bit in the book that I was reading, which I find really interesting, is I, mean, I said at the beginning that we do take it for granted and, and we see these trucks roll by and we, we may see somebody open the door and think, oh, it's probably a bit cold in there. But what I found fascinating, I mean, you've had some experience of actually going at the beginning of the supply chain, haven't you, to, to, you know, some of these factories. Could you just tell listeners a bit about that? Yes, well, so, I mean, like going to, to harvest the ice throughout the book, I sort of wherever I could go and, and experience something in person, I did. Um, just because, I mean, half of it for me is just curiosity. I want to see these these spaces. And I think also, you know, I, I thought all these foodies want to know the condition of the farm where they're, you know, chicken was raised, but they've never seen inside a refrigerated warehouse let's go. And so I, at the start of the book, I went and I worked just for a week, but did shifts in refrigerated warehouses here in Southern California. And which is, a, you know, outside, it's just gorgeous blue skies, you know, <laughs> uh, 22 degrees, couldn't be more perfect. And then you, uh, and then you go inside and it's just, I mean, it sounds, uh, very stupid to say it, but it is really cold. And it's all very well at first, brisk, refreshing. After hours working in there and your toes are cold and your fingers are cold and your nose won't stop running, um, it is quite agonizing. Um, it just, uh, you know, if you have uh, like the men, it's, it's all men. I was the only woman. The men who had facial hair had icicles in their mustaches and beards. The guys who wore glasses would just constantly steam up because you're going in and out of the the rooms on the uh, forklift trucks, moving things around. Um, it's a very weird world because it's dark in there because lighting uses electricity, produces heat. So it's kept in this sort of blue gray um sort of twilight um the floor glitters because it's covered in ice crystals um everything feels muffled and i later discovered there is a scientific reason for that because sound and light actually travel more slowly in the cold so y it, you you just have this sense of sort of being almost underwater in a sense um and then there's just the beeping of the forklifts and what it's a very peculiar smell yeah. as well. Um, people I spoke to just said, oh, yes, that's the smell of cold. And, I, <laughs> and everyone who works in cold storage knows it, but it's very hard to describe. It's just sort of, 
metallic and um, slightly, I don't I do, yeah, it, it really, really, I mean, very particular rooms have their own smell for sure. The frozen pizza room, absolutely disgusting. You will never pick up a frozen, I haven't had a frozen pizza since, honestly. The smell of a room full of, you know, tombstone pepperoni deluxe just is absolutely rancid and you can't even store ice cream in the same room because it will pick up the smell um so everyone knows that it's sort of considered you know you got the ice cream you got the pizza room today it's sort of you know (laughs) it's a bad draw my perception is that people who work work in cold storage probably pop in and go out again but from what you've been saying you're there for what hours on end in the same environment yeah, I mean, you do drive. So the whole facility is cold, though. So you're you're moving between different temperatures. So you might be moving between the loading dock and, say, the freezer room. So the freezer room will be, um, and all the temperatures are in Fahrenheit in the book because that's what America still uses for whatever bizarre reason. But the, the freezer room will be <laughs> one one temperature, very cold. Uh, the loading dock will be, you know. S- more closer to your home fridge um so more slightly more you know <laughs> palatable you know than the uh, so you're moving back and forth between those zones and yes for uh, i mean you get a break every few hours uh, we you the, you do exercises in the uh, in the machine room because it's the warmest room in the entire building but it's it does seep in and so for that part of the book, I, you know, after working there and experiencing it, I did some research and talked to some people because the other thing is that's funny is you hear so much these days about the benefits of cold. People are all doing their open yes. water swimming and cold plunges, cold plunges yeah. and all of that. Exactly. And so I thought, well, maybe this is actually really super healthy. Um, and it turns out that no, uh, you know, there's, there is good science around the benefits of, you know, dunking yourself in cold water in the winter. But it's a, it's a all about the, how quick you just do that quickly. If you have to actually work in the cold, it's it's incredibly difficult, bad and hard. It's it, you know, your blood pre- it has effects on your blood pressure. It has effects on your immunity. Um, it's just also just very hard. I mean, one of the... Uh, the doctors have this expression, the umbles, um, you mumble, grumble, stumble and fumble because, again, you just sort of slow down in the cold. And actually, the work plans for workers in refrigerated warehouses have to take that into account because you just operate more slowly. Um it's a, I mean, it's a known cold stupid is what mountaineers call it as well. So it's a known thing. You just you just sort of slow down and people think it's partly just due to the distraction of being so uncomfortable. Um, and also then a slowed reaction time just sort of, and it's funny because the reason cold works to preserve food is because it slows down the metabolism of the bacteria and the the fungi that would be eating our meat and dairy. And it slows down how fast our produce is, is metabolizing and thus dying. And so it, it, it works. We we know this. That's yes. how it works. It works so by slowing things slow down. down. <laughs> but then for the people who are in, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> it slows yeah. us yeah. down too. I hadn't thought of it, yeah. but it really I, does. I, I suppose um, you probably, you, me, you mentioned they were mainly men working there. Um, I would have thought that the demeanour of them, if I was if I was working in the cold for eight hours or 10 hours or so, I'd be quite a miserable person by the end of it. Did you find that with the people? Was there a certain sort of um, demeanour they had? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. What they told me is, listen, a lot of people start and, and they really want a job. They really need a job. And at lunchtime, they disappear because oh, by, by they just yeah, yeah, can't yeah. handle it. Yeah. So it's, it's a, uh, it's more, I think that a lot of people just can't mm. hack it and they, they quit. The turnover was very high and they, and they told me they're always trying to recruit women actually. But, um, uh, again, it's sort of how everyone has a slightly different tolerance for cold and it's to do with, you know, a complex set of, you know, how tall you are, how much surface area you are, a, you know, ratio of brown fat to, uh, white fat, where it's deposited, slow twitch to fast twitch muscles. There's a whole sort of set of things going on that determine 
how cold you're going to yes. feel uh, in relation to the temperature. And I think, you know, people self-select in, they can handle it a little, little better. And the guys who I spoke to, yeah, I mean, it's not a barrel of love. Mm. I've worked in uh, places where people are having more fun, <laughs> definitely. And it is very yeah. dangerous. Warehouse wor- work is already one of the most dangerous um, professions. And then you're working in this in the cold. So people are, are very focused because you know, you've got this slippery surface on the floor, your your own reaction time is slowed down, it is lethal. Um, so there wasn't a lot of laughing and joking, but at break times, you know, people, I think the main sense that I got was this sense of they wished that people knew what it took to get their food to them. I mean, one of them said to me, listen, I go to the supermarket and I see this and I see the yogurts there and I think, that wouldn't be there if it wasn't for me like they, this none of this would get to you but we're invisible no one knows no one knows this world exists well, so a wonderful experience you had really um for the book doing that research you know working for a week in a place like that it would have no doubt changed the way you you thought about the way that our food gets to us can, can you tell us about because i know you were Absolutely. quite some of my research you were quite hands-on in this research can you tell us can you tell us um of any other interesting experiences you had that like that where you sort of didn't know anything about it and then (laughs) it changed the way you thought are you able to do that for us Nicola? yes absolutely so there are a few different um uh examples i sort of i wherever i could do something i did do something so i harvested ice um which is terrific fun actually sort of a communal activity i mean yes you're getting cold but it's sort of you know it's it's more like winter winter fun in a in a in a weird way um and how thick is the ice that you're harvesting oh it's about this ice was about a foot thick uh, again sorry it's a it's a 305 US millimeters but you know uh <laughs> sorry we, <laughs> i mean we still but we still use both um, in the uk so for, it's it's okay nicola it's all right it, it's temperature that i just have lost the ability to go back and forth between which is a shame um but uh, but yeah, so uh, I harvested the ice. You saw that it, it's quite fun, actually. They sort of draw out the lines on the lake, and then you have these enormous saws back and forth through the ice. Um, then you use something called a breaker bar to sort of pop the. It's almost like um, if you have a chocolate bar and you're just snapping the last oh, segments right. off. Yeah. So you use the breaker bar to sort of snap the segments. Um, and then you have what's called a pike pole, which is something you use to move the ice through the open channel of water that you've sort of, you know, you've, you've cut out toward the ice house itself. And then the team in the ice house, and I didn't do this because this is much more dangerous work. They don't let amateurs do it because the ice sort of, it, it gets hauled up a slope in to slide down into the ice house and it comes in fast. So everyone says inbound and this cake of ice comes zooming in. Um, and it's almost, uh, it's almost like, it looks like hockey or something. The, these guys are there with their, uh, sticks to try and guide it into the right place without it breaking um and so you fill the whole house you can fill you know it, this was a sort of anyone who wanted could have a go and it was very popular the year i went because frozen had an ice harvesting scene in it oh. and so all the little disney princesses had persuaded their parents to bring them <laughs> and so uh so it was very popular and everyone was having a go, but we managed to harvest the entire lake in a day. Um, and then I went back in the summer and the ice was still there, frozen, wow. solid, just this glittering kind of blue monolith in, in the ice house. And we used that to make ice cream. Right. So there was a reward, delayed reward. So you can actually, uh, health and safety little thing coming up here. So you can actually eat and drink this, this ice candy that's come straight out of the lake. Uh, so that's a great question. Um, no, you don't eat and drink it. You use it to cool other things. So we used it to make ice cream in one of those old-fashioned hand-cranked ones. Yes. And you put a, 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 you chip up the ice, you put some salt in there, and then you use that to go. It's sort of your custard, your ice cream custard is enclosed 
in that container doesn't ever come into contact with the icy salt mixture that's freezing it. No. So yeah, you don't. And they and the rest of the ice that we harvested was actually sold to fishermen. And they use it, apparently it lasts longer, natural ice lasts longer than commercial ice, manufactured ice, because it has fewer air bubbles in it, um, just because of the way it's formed more slowly. And so they really like taking it out on the water because it lasts it lasts forever. I mean, they, they say that you can go out for a week, 10 days, the block of ice is still fine. And so they're using it to cool fish while they're out on the water, but they're not eating it, drinking it, etc. And that's what ice, you know, Interestingly, obviously before the invention of mechanical refrigeration, people would chip it up and put it in their drinks. And it's actually one of the things that led to the downfall of the natural ice trade is that water started getting so polluted. So mm. even as, as late as 1907, so New York City already has cars, skyscrapers, you know, it's it's a modern city. They used more natural ice in New New York City than uh, mechanically made ice that year, and the and that was the sort of the turning point that that point because the city started to get so big and dump so much of their own waste in the water mm -hmm. that increasingly people were becoming very ill from using natural ice, and that's really what prompted the switch was that you know that natural ice was so disgusting. Some great experiences, though, on, on that lake. Um, if we could just turn though, to the science part of it. I mean, obviously, there's a difference between keeping things refrigerated and, and freezing things. If you're just chilling something, what temperature does it need to be at? Yeah, that makes it, that makes sense. And it's a really interesting question because it's actually slightly different for every commodity. So in an ideal world, the colder, the better, right? Um, because at all microbes have slightly different tolerances and you find some that are very happy in the cold actually and then you have to go a little bit colder um but you know we don't you run into first of all the cost of making things that cold so you, you know you don't want to go colder than you have to and second of all um so you've got it you've got to balance like the energy versus how long you actually want to keep it um and then second of all not everything likes being really cold. So as people will know, if you freeze certain things, the texture really suffers um, because what freezing does, freezing preserves in two ways. It's not just slowing down metabolism and, and, and really halting, actually, in the case of, a, you know, there are very few microbes that do very well at, at frozen temperatures. So it's really halting that decay, but it's 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 also because you've locked up the water in crystal form. Now there isn't any water available for microbes and fungi. So you've hit them there too. It's a double preservation yeah. method. The downside, of course, is that those ice crystals are sharp and pointy and they break down cell walls. So you do have texture problems and all sorts of hideous industry names um, for then, you know, which people will have experienced when you defrost a chicken breast. There's all that liquid around it, drip, it's called um, technically in the industry. That's that's partly to do with this problem of the ice crystals having broken down some cell walls and you get some sort of seepage as a result. And, and that will affect, you know, how flavorsome, juicy, delicious the resulting piece of chicken is. So it's always this kind of balancing act between how cold you have to go for preservation, how cold can you go and retain the flavor and the taste and the texture that you want um how you know how much energy like can, how much can you get away with i.e if you know you're going to eat it quite soon then you don't have to keep it as cold because whatever bacteria and fungi won't have long enough to reproduce so it's always this balancing act and arriving at the recommendations was actually a really interesting process because when refrigeration was first introduced, you know, warehousemen were like, brilliant, this is magic. Uh, we'll stick stuff in here. It'll be great forever. And they would sell, you know, 10-year-old turkeys and, you know, 
<laughs> two year old <laughs> apples and they weren't very good surprisingly enough yeah. and they didn't have as they they put everything in together potatoes apples meat fish all at the same temperature which is absolutely i mean in the, one of the in the fruit and vegetables section what you realize is fruit and vegetables are basically like pop stars with the most with riders. They all need slightly different temperatures, slightly different humidity levels, slightly different atmospheric blends even to be happy. And the and the impact is, you know, it's not just, oh, it won't keep as long. If you keep a, a ripe tomato at below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the genetic machinery for making flavor switches off and you can't well, switch it on again. That's a really good point. So on you're the, actually destroying things. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really good point. And I think it was on the, the Mike Carruthers Something You Should Know podcast when you were on and you were saying about tomatoes. And since that, I, I've been keeping tomatoes. And I haven't been putting them in the fridge. I've been keeping them with the fruit. Um, yes, they don't last yeah. as long, but they taste a lot better. <laughs> that's the thing I do if there's one thing I'd like to you know people are always like oh what do you wish people knew I think listen don't try and keep it forever it's not getting better um and eating your tomatoes more quickly uh you know you, maybe you have to go to the shops more often or maybe you don't have tomatoes every single day of the week uh that but they taste so much better and here's the other piece they're better for you. Now you put a bag of spinach in the week and you, uh, I mean, in the fridge for a week and you think it's just as good because it hasn't gone bad. No, the vitamin and mineral content of that has gone down by about 50%. Mm. So it's, it's not just flavor that you're losing over time in the fridge. It's also the very thing you're eating this spinach for, you know, the vitamins, which, the minerals, which, yeah, that, that, all the things that are good for you. Well, yeah. Yeah. I and mean, that brings me to another question. And, and I don't know whether it's become an urban myth, but but what's the truth in, I mean, you see advertisements in it, we certainly do in the UK, where, where you see a, I don't know, some fruit being picked or some peas, say, for example, being harvested in a field. And, and virtually going straight into into deep freeze with the insinuation that it's actually fresher than it would be if you've bought it and kept it for a couple of days. What What's the truth in that, Nicola? I think that's actually one of those advertising things that does have a good grain of truth in it. Oh, right. Um, if, yeah, I know, it's, it's shocking, <laughs> isn't it? Um, I'm but if food is... <laughs> if food is harvested pre-cooled and frozen almost immediately as it is on these you know big frozen food uh farms they can cool down they'll take a within you know an hour of a pea being off the you know the, off the uh vine it will have been pre-cooled down and then ready to go into the freezer and that does lock in a lot more of the vitamin and the vitamins and the minerals than if it had to be trucked to you know a, a distribution center and then from there to your Sainsbury's and then it sits on your shelf at your Sainsbury's for a few days and then you buy it and then you were going to eat it that evening but actually something else happened so now you're going to eat it in a week's time you should have got the frozen peas mm. um so it's 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 actually there's some truth in that. Um, not for everything. You can't freeze everything well, but uh, but it, there is some truth in it. Yeah. And would that apply as well to, say, fish? Because, again, you, I've, I've seen situations where they, they catch some fish and it's more or less frozen straight away. If you bought some frozen fish um, and, you know, kept it for a month in the freezer and then and then defrosted it, compared with, say, buying some, in quotes, fresh fish, what would be what would be better for you? Oh, that's a it was so that again, that's a different question because it's fruits and vegetables where they're losing vitamins and minerals as because the thing about fruits and vegetables that people don't necessarily realize, I didn't, they're still alive. They've been harvested, but they're still metabolizing and they're still essentially breathing. They call it respiring, so we're not freaked out, but they're breathing. Mm. Yeah. And they only have a certain number of breaths left before they die. Oh, right. And every and because they've been, you know, so the whole goal is to make them breathe as slowly as possible so they last as long as possible. But when they're metabolizing, because they don't have their parent plant there anymore to provide sugars and nutrients, they're drawing on their own resources. And that's why the longer, you know, the apple sits around, the fewer nutrients it has, because 
it's using them to keep itself alive. Yeah. Now, fish, meat, dairy, it's dead. Uh, there's no other way to, I mean, when the, when the refrigerated meat trade first started, they called it the dead meat trade because that, that, that is exactly what it is. Yeah. So it's not burning through its own resources. The amount of protein in there will be identical at the start and at the finish. Um, what you can do is lose flavor, texture, sort of deliciousness um, if you keep things too long in the freezer or if your home freezer isn't that great and you can get freezer burn, things like that. But otherwise, you're not losing nutrients. So it's not a question of what's better for you. It can be a question of what's more delicious. Yes. Um, these days, people in the in LA are dry aging fish. They're saying it's the same way you might dry age a steak. Oh, yeah. um, they're allowing it to get a little bit of that sort of uh, age on it for the for flavor reasons. And so it's also, you know, do you want the peak of freshness? It just came out of the ocean, frozen right there on the boat kept in good condition in your home freezer because your home freezer is at the right temperature and doesn't fluctuate. Great. That's one option. Or also possible to, you know, to enjoy a dry aged fish and get a slightly different flavor. It's not about, it's about your flavor choices and your texture choices yeah. rather than nutrition. And that's, that's another thing, just on a practical point of view, most of us, we buy our white goods, we buy a fridge, we buy a freezer um, and we tend to keep it until it packs up. But I know I've done a temperature check in my fridge because um, I do a bit of brewing. So I've got one of these infrared temperature gauges and I know that there's a different temperature at the top of the fridge as to the bottom. So the bottom would be sort of four degrees centigrade and the top would, could be eight or nine degrees. So there's a there's quite a big fluctuation in those temperatures. It's really interesting. Yeah. It, it also amazing that you're a brewer because it is the brewers that we really have to thank for mechanical refrigeration. They were the ones who invested the money to make the, you know, the machines that made cold work. The oh, was first it? commercial refrigerations sold to breweries, Truman's in London. Oh, really? Um, so uh, a uh, machine, was, machine was created by an Australian, but he had to come come to the uk to sell it <laughs> that's really interesting and of course so, uh, you can't so, make yeah. lager without without cold um refrigeration that that's, was the incentive yeah, yeah wow yeah. yeah and actually do you know what i've heard you might be in uh people say because in uh in california there wasn't mechanical refrigeration for a long time so instead of lager they had steam beer you get anchor steam still to this day and the whole principle there is that you're cooling it off very quickly hence the steam to try and get this lager yeast that isn't happy in, in the yeah. warmth to sort of perform they say that beer in north korea is basically steam beer is because it? there isn't refrigeration oh, that's interesting yeah. Uh, yeah this is what defectors have said yeah, 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 which yeah. i did which i didn't know anyway that was a side sort of side point from your argument which is that yes fridges have very different temperatures they are inconsistent people always say don't put your milk in the door because the do. door is much warmer than yeah. the rest of it I of course i do too mm. i mean uh, it, it's also to do with the thing that people have to remember is how long are you trying to keep it? I get through my milk in the time that it's, you know, it, it, it doesn't go bad before I drink it. So it's fine to keep it in the door. So I mean, there's a little bit of common sense here too. I mean, how long are you trying to keep things? Don't try and keep them forever. I think that's the other thing. People think their fridge is this sort of thing that will, it's almost like a bank fault. You put it in there and it's it's going to stay It'll the same. Fine. No, it's no. still perishable. <laughs> it's still, you know, you, you still have to eat it. It isn't a bank vault. You can't keep things in there indefinitely. Well, I mean, you can if you put in, I don't know, um, people keep all sorts of strange things in their fridges, uh, you know, uh, but it's <laughs> photographic film, etc. <laughs> but it's not a bank vault. So, no. st you know, eat your perishables is the message. It's interesting, isn't it? I, I know that in the 70s, um, my mother had a big chest freezer. They, they, were, the, they were the rage. Um, and I think a lot of it was, um, well, part, partly because the 70s from an economic point of view were quite tough and people were having allotments and growing a lot of vegetables in the garden. But the other thing is the, the weekly shop came in. Um, and yeah. I, I, I think now more people seem to be shopping. The, a lot of the supermarket, supermarkets in the UK, uh, there's like Marks and Spencer's Food, they, they virtually reinvented themselves now. Um, they, they, of course, still do clothes, but they've got a lot of the food supermarkets where people will go in and, and you see them buying 
for almost like they used to, um, smaller amounts more frequently. Is that the same in the in the US? Uh, it's it is in the cities, and it's an interesting thing you're you're pointing out actually because it's to do with how refrigeration and supermarkets sort of reshaped reshaped the urban environment because as you point out in the 70s as people moved out to the suburbs and the weekly shop sort of became a thing people had cars to bring it all home in they had a chest freezer at home to store it in Um, and you had the out of town space where you could have a big supermarket and a big you know car park to go with it what that did was really shift the geography of how people lived and shopped, and it absolutely destroyed town centers. And in some places, West Germany was one, Italy was one, there was legislation in place to say, no, actually, we don't want our town centers hollowed out this way. There's a limit on the size of the out-of-town supermarkets because they do have this just enormously chilling <laughs> again, pun intended, effect on uh, on the commerce of the city centre. If you aren't there, then you aren't going to pop into the, you know, to the ironmongers or the, you know, the, the bakers yeah. nearby or blah, blah, blah. You'll just go to the supermarket and do it all. So I think that is an interesting thing. And it reconfigured people's homes too, because now you need more storage space um, for that chest freezer to do the weekly shop. You eat differently. It's, you know, then people started, oh, now you have a chest freezer. Well, now we can have chicken Kievs, the chain, you know, we can have fish mm. fingers, all of these convenience foods take off. So it really did have a, a huge impact on the the sort of layout, the design of how we live, but also then the food we ate. And I think one thing that's happened in, interestingly is that those patterns have begun to change more so I would say actually in the UK, I think you're right. Um, but as that's happening, the refrigerated warehouses are having to change where they are because they were all set up for out of town distribution, big warehouse, take a giant truck to the, to the supermarket and unload. Well, if you're trying to do these much more smaller, more frequent deliveries to a city center, you can't have a giant truck taking a giant load. You have to be much more nimble. And so there's actually a big boom. It's funny because you would think, gosh, the U.S. has all the cold space it could possibly need. And it does, but it's in the wrong space, in the wrong place. So there's actually a, a gigantic refrigerated warehouse boom underway in the U.S. Oh, as it? a lot of these huge refrigerated warehouses relocate to be nearer the urban center to respond to this kind of just in time. Also things like delivery, people wanting, you know, they order it in the morning, they want it delivered to their workplace that day or whatever. Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's much quicker, smaller, more nimble, like the old days, but not quite like the old days. <laughs> and, uh, and that is changing the geography again. So it is, it is really interesting how these things sort of go hand in hand. And, and looking to the future, I mean, we, we spoke earlier on about how freezing, if we look back through you know, man's evolution and everything, it's part of our evolution, this, this constant requirement to freeze stuff and, and chill stuff. And I guess we always will in some form, but what what developments are there any developments taking place that could reduce the amount that we rely upon for uh, refrigeration do you think yeah i love this question when i um when i started writing this book there hadn't been a popular book about refrigeration there had been textbooks for technicians and things but there hadn't been a popular book about refrigeration since the 1950s um and I read that book and in it, the guy on the final page just said, well, the, you know, refrigeration's great. It's a huge step forward for humanity, but probably just, you know, you know, soon it will look outdated and we'll have invented the next thing for food preservation. And if you look at human history, we do uh, keep improving our food preservation methods. I mean, canning was the big breakthrough before um, refrigeration, but once we figured out how to make things cold it's like we took our eye off the ball and we were like great refrigeration works done solved but unfortunately and this is something that uh is sort of still not really talked about enough although while I was writing the book the UN formed its first sort of uh committee to address this problem which is that 
Cooling is a gigantic con- contribute. Uh, uh, cooling is a gigantic contributor to climate change, not just because of the energy required to run. You know, to create cold, it's thermodynamics to sort of to to take cold heat energy out of something. You need an enormous amount of energy. Yeah. Um, even assuming you could produce all that uh, using solar or wind or whatever, which you can't because we just haven't scaled that up quickly enough. It does. It wouldn't even meet current demands, let alone the expanded demands of a cold chain. Um, there's, that's not the only problem. The other problem is refrigerants, the gases themselves that we use in refrigeration machinery are refrigerant control is the number one thing that humanity can do to get a handle on climate change, according to Project Drawdown, which is the sort of climate change think tank. And when they came out with that headline, they were like, what? We were as surprised as everyone else. We didn't see that coming because refrigeration sort of slides under the radar. People think, oh, well, because we need it. It doesn't get questioned in the same way. And it, but it's actually a disaster. And if uh, sub Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, the quote unquote rest of the world refrigerates to the same extent as the US and the UK, I mean, what one expert said to me is there won't be a harvest to store in those refrigerated warehouses if if we so it's actually a complete sort of looming disaster and it's not really being thought about. There are people, you know, another um, a guy at the University of Birmingham said to me, refrigeration is really the sort of um, the Cinderella of of. Uh, you know, tech investing and food preservation is even more so. I mean, that's not where the hot money is going. Hot money is going into RNA vaccines and, you know, (laughs) whatnot. It's, uh, you know, new weight loss drugs. It's not, people are not pouring money into food preservation solutions. There is one company that I got quite excited about uh, here in California. And it's what they do basically is very clever um, a guy who was actually focused on thin film polymer physics for making solar panels more efficient. And he realized, oh, you can use these thin films to do all sorts of things. And one of the things you can use them to do is create a perfectly optimized microclimate inside, say, an apple. Um, and that th- that will keep it. He, he's managed. He makes these these layers, there's the nano uh, thick thickness of layers made out of uh, food particles. So he collects like the skins from tomato canneries or the pits and oh, yeah. um, skins from guacamole factories, from avocados and things like that. So it's all food waste, all perfectly natural particles, creates this very, very thin film and it, it keeps... I went there and I saw there were um, peppers, you know, like red, orange, yellow peppers that had been sat out for six weeks, eight wow. weeks at room temperature. And next to them were uncoated ones that hadn't had this special coating uh, attached. And they were exactly as disgusting as you'd, you'd, you'd expect, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a pepper that you'd left out on the counter for eight weeks. And the ones that had been coated after eight weeks, yeah, you weren't going to... Um, put them out with some hummus they did not look that good but but you would have put them in a stir fry they were they they were still perfectly edible was the coating put on after after it's harvested or, or was it sort of modified yes. as it was great right okay and and obviously i'll ask the obvious question is it is it you know are they safe to eat you know is the, is the question i suppose yes yeah so a uh, I was sort of surprised because I was like, well, people were like, oh, it's a coating. And uh, I think a lot of people have a negative association of coating with wax. Yeah, and wax. This, yeah. Exactly. And it's, and yeah, this is not that. No. This is a very thin film made of food particles. So molecules that are extracted from food. Uh, so it's perfectly safe to eat. There's nothing. I mean, it's coming from a tomato and an avocado. It's, it's, it's stuff you would eat anyway. Yes. And the trick of it is this thin film polymer physics where because, and this is far beyond my pay grade in science terms, but it just it, it's the way it assembles as it dries that creates this membrane that basically 
almost non-existent. You can't, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I licked one of these coated limes to see if I could taste it. No, absolutely not. It's so, um, it's, it is barely there, but what it does is it, uh, is able to, uh, modify the amount of oxygen going in, carbon dioxide going out, water vapor, etc., and just keep this totally optimized microclimate for the produce. And the guy, what I thought was so fascinating is he said, you know, fresh used to mean it was locally grown and it was recently harvested. And then refrigeration changed that because suddenly it could be fresh, but it could have been stored for 10 months. And he said, what I'm what I'm doing is going to change what fresh means again, because fresh is going to mean it has more of the stuff that was in it when it was harvested in it still when you eat it. Is this still at developmental stage? It's actually commercial. You can buy the seven. I think they've got eight different because they have to develop a new coating for each um produce because again like I said they're all like they're pop stars with their riders and they all need slightly different amounts of so they develop a slightly different formula and a slightly different application for each one um and it's just applied at the packing house when the fruit or vegetable comes in from the field you wash it you do all the things you would normally do pre-cool and then you spray this um and then it's it's good to go and so you can get I think eight different there's lemons you can uh you can get a a variety of them at the supermarket already um what's interesting is right now it's being used in the u.s as a shelf life extender so the you know the pepper is coated in this and refrigerated so it lasts Uh. even longer (laughs) but his point is well yeah because we've already built a cold chain and also no one in the u.s would trust anything if it wasn't refrigerated because we've been so sort of indoctrinated to think well it can't be fresh if it isn't refrigerated but his point is, well, at least in parts of the world where they haven't built a cold chain yet, yeah. this could sidestep that. Mm. Not for meat, not for dairy. And this is one of the things that I think is so important is I think the future needs more solutions that are suited for the context. Refrigeration's a real one size fits all. We use a vast amount of energy to make it cold and then bing, we're done. You know, it's it's like... It, but no, if we could think about, you know, fruit and vegetables separately from meat and dairy or and dairy separately from meat and fish, they all actually could have different solutions that worked better, gave us better tasting, healthier food and had less of an environmental footprint. We could have a better food system. And my, I sort of end the book with the, with the thought that, you know, I go to Rwanda to look at, you know, what they're doing there and uh, this sort of initiative to try and do a better, you know, version of, uh, you know, if a country is going to refrigerate, how can we do it better? And I think the idea is like, well, these countries, they didn't have to build landlines. They went straight to mobile phones. They didn't have to, you know, have checkbooks. They went straight to digital banking. Yes. So what can happen there that would actually deliver a better food system? Um, and what of the pitfalls that we have now, you know, sort of experienced with refrigeration, can they avoid? One last question I've got. Well, I've got two last questions, if that's okay. From your research and the writing of the book, what have you learned about food storage and what advice and considerations would you like readers and listeners to consider when making their food choices? I know we've answered some of them, like the tomatoes, for example, but but what, yeah. what else would you say? Oh, definitely. Well, I mean, I'll say eat it. Eat it. If you've bought, if you've bought your vegetable, eat it. Don't assume it's getting any better in the fridge because it's really not um don't put your tomatoes in the fridge please uh just eat them they will taste better um i will say my one number one hack is you know when you buy like parsley or um uh coriander and it goes uh floppy and limp almost straight away if you don't use it well um you can create a sort of little home modified atmosphere storage for it. So what you do is you stand your your parsley or your coriander up in a jam jar full of water, like it's a like it's a bunch of flowers. Yes, and then you put a plastic bag, uh, just as a ziploc or a you know a food storage bag over the top. Um, you don't seal it up. You just sort of sit it over it so that it's it's around it. Um, and that I now have coriander just sitting there in my in my fridge for two three weeks, no problem. Oh, you still keep it in um, the fridge, but you, so, you put this pl- this plastic bag over it. Yeah, but in in a in a yeah. glass of water or and something. That, 
Exactly. And it creates a sort of mini modified atmosphere. So it's changing slightly the water vapor. It's, you know, having learned about modified atmosphere and how important that is for fruit and vegetables while writing that chapter, um, I realized, oh, wow, I could, you can, it's not, it's not, you know, the same as having a warehouse that is all at exactly the right atmosphere, no. but you can sort you got your of own create mini the one. correct. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Um, so that's something, that's my, that's my hot trick. Yeah. One, one, I was going to ask something about the writing process because we, we've had, we have quite a number of authors on, on the show and, and I have to say my, my perception of, um, people who write on non-fictions change significantly and as much as the people that are right we had a, a lady on talking about the moon um it was a subject she she liked but she never really knew about it before there seemed to be a lot of um, oh was that rebecca yeah 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 it was yeah rebecca oh brilliant yeah. yeah yeah she's great yeah she was you know her do you yeah 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 great guest um it, it seems to be something about if you know a bit about it's the research part of it which stimulates you to want to write the book, I think. Um, what would you say to somebody who's got a particular sort of subject? It may not be food, but it, if they've got a particular interest, it could be a science subject, it could be an art subject, and they're thinking about writing a book, what what advice would you give? Them? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I do, I mean, this is just me, but I do think be be as curious as you can be. Go down every rabbit hole Um because the things you'll discover, I thought I knew, I mean, even as I was, you know, my final, you know, months of writing this, I was discovering things about refrigeration. People would say, blah, 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 blah. And then they'd say, of course, you should look at refrigeration's impact on divorce rates. And I'd think, I never even thought of that. Oh, and really? go down a whole other <laughs> rabbit hole. Yes. Refrigeration on divorce? How does it's that a, work? It's a, uh, basically women can go out to work once you have a refrigerator and, uh, it, oh, it really, yeah. uh, change. Yes. Mm. So, um, people have looked into this a lot. They call them, uh, engines of liberation because <laughs> basically once you can Don't let them fill drive. the fridge and not have to do a daily <laughs> yeah. shop. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> Anyway, (laughs) it's a, it's an interesting thing. So these things, and I do find that a lot of, uh, you just wonder something, you, you, you know, you pursue your curiosity. I've always found, and people are very willing to talk. That's the other thing I found is, um, you know, the people who are the world expert on, you know, I don't know, the post-harvest physiology of a blueberry, not many people are, are completely fascinated by what they do. So if you are, they want to talk to you. Mm. <laughs> and, and so there's a way to, and, and that's, uh, that's actually bizarrely interesting. So I say just pursue your curiosity, talk to people, think, and in talking to people, other people will have questions and that will send you down a whole nother rabbit hole. So yes, you might never write the book that way. Um, I mean, I got close, I got close myself. Yeah. <laughs> And, and talking about writing books, what are you working on now? Ah, uh, well, I'm about to set off on <laughs> on the yeah. I'm, I mean, the podcast is actually essentially a full time job. So, um, and there were a lot of evenings and weekends spent working on this book that I am very happy to have back temporarily. I do also write for the New Yorker, so I have a couple of articles for them I'm working on, um, which will take some time. And uh, I'm heading off on book tour, but yeah, I do. I have a couple of they're, they're too early to um too early to say, but I am I have I have something in the works. We'll Excellent. see. I'm I'm determined not to spend another six or seven years on it. So hopefully you'll see me out with another with another book in a few years. Well, we'll have to we'll invite you back when it comes out. Thank you. Okay. Um, where can people reach you and and find out more about you? Yeah, um, nicolatwilly.com. So first name, last name dot com has all of my information and contact details and uh, the details of my podcast, Gastropod, which you can find wherever you look for podcasts. It has where to buy the book. It has links to excerpts if you want to just get a taste of it. Um, and it has links to all my writings. So if you want to read what I wrote about for The New Yorker, you know, I, talk, I, I did a profile of the the world's most famous maze designer for example went to Hampton Court oh yeah uh went to Longleat did all the uh so 
all of that's on there. So I think that's probably the best place to start, nicolatwilly.com. And I'm Nicola Twilly on, on Instagram and Twitter too. Okay. Well, like I said, I, I've, I've sort of heard about a quarter of the book so far, and I'm really looking forward to, to finishing it when I go on holiday next week. So um, that'll, be, that'll be really good. And I've managed to resist all the cool and chill jokes that I was thinking of talking about. <laughs> throughout you, you I noticed that you did a couple of Nicola which, which are very good but I did resist I just, I'm sorry yeah it's uh, it's an occupational hazard I really yeah. try not to but yes I thought I might have got the cold shoulder if, you, if you'd said something if I'd said something so. oh um, there it goes no, you no. couldn't resist um this bit well stay cool that's stay all I cool. have to say I will keep chilled I'll keep chilled yeah there we go Nicola, this has been a really fascinating conversation. It's It's been really interesting to learn more about refrigeration. And I think it's something we just take for granted. I think that your insights can give us some really useful, useful advice on how we use our fridges and how we make our food choices. My guest today has been Nicola Twilley. Nicola is author of the book Frostbite, How Refrigeration Changed Our Food, Our Planet and Ourselves. And she's the co-host of Gastropod Podcast. And you can find links to the book and the podcast in the show notes. Thank you for coming on the show, Nicola. Thank you so much for having me. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I will be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best.